talking a little uh, statewide news. Joining us to talk about the latest Texas and national political news out there, GOP political strategist and co-founder of MustReadTexas.com, Matt McCoviak. Matt, good morning. Morning, Chad. How are you? Doing well. Uh, how about yourself? Doing great. Well, it was uh, obviously big uh, week for Republicans out there, uh, Democrats, Still searching for answers. You got a couple of stories today, or at least one on the Texas Tribune, uh, where they're they're trying to find out what went wrong for Democrats. I mean, that's been a story uh, statewide and even nationally now for a week. Uh, in, in your mind, as far as what we saw here in the state, uh, obviously, Craig Abbott huge win. Dem- Republicans overall statewide uh, huge wins. W- was this a result of Texas? moving maybe even further to the right, uh, an extremely flawed candidate uh, or, or candidate system uh, for the Democrats, or maybe a mixture of everything? Yeah, a little bit of a mixture of that. You know, I think that uh, the Democrats and Wendy you know, Davis's campaign want to blame it on the, the, uh, you know, the anti-Obama wave. Um, but look, I think even if Obama's numbers were more in the mid-40s, low, high 40s, you know, she still would have lost by probably 15, 16 points. So I, th- I think the wave probably caused it to go from being a Bill White uh, type performance of around 42, 43 percent to a, you know, essentially a Tony Sanchez performance of around 39 <clears> percent. <throat> so, but I think if you step back and, and say, you know, the, the prop, what was the problem with Wendy's campaign? The problem is she had no message, she had no appeal to crossover voters, and pretty much everything Battleground Texas said about, you know, changing the traditional turnout. Uh, and getting minority voters to turn out in Texas didn't bear out. You know, whether they were lying or it just didn't work or they were surprised, you know, I, I guess we'll never know or, or maybe we will know. I don't know, but, it, you know, it just it just didn't happen. It didn't manifest itself. I mean, nobody thought with $35 million the Democrats would go backwards yeah. uh, in 2014 compared to the last midterm in 2010, but they did. They went backwards. They went backwards in a significant way. I mean, you're going to have 98 Republicans in the in the House. Uh, you picked up the only competitive Senate, uh, Senate seat. Wendy Davis's old Senate seat went Republican. Um, you know, we won some some key uh, county races in, in places like Dallas County. Uh, you know, Abbott won Harris County. He won Bear County. You know, these were, were significant victories. So, the Democrats, you know, they they may have better lists and they may have slightly better voter data than they had before. But you know that is certainly not worth thirty-five million dollars. I mean, I think in the in the final analysis, they took a major step backwards uh, in in two thousand fourteen. It's going to make it even harder, I think, for Battleground Texas to continue uh, in its current state. I mean, they had something like three hundred staff yeah. uh, between the, the Davis campaign and Battleground Texas. There's, I mean, those, those people are not being paid as we speak. There's no, there's just no way. Visiting Matt McCoviak. Matt, let's uh, kind of take a look forward uh, for yeah. Republicans. What can we expect? There seems to be this uncertainty, maybe, uh, from some state newspapers and, and writers out there about what's going to happen with Dan Patrick, you know, lieutenant governor now. Uh, what's going to happen with uh, uh, the direction he takes things uh, in the next legislative session? Tell us a little bit about what, what you think the direction Dan Patrick's, Patrick's going to go in, and are we going to see any fireworks uh, this session between he and other Republicans, as I guess some are predicting out there? Yeah, that's the, the big question that, that people are asking now as we look forward towards legislative session. And I should say, as a disclaimer here at the top, my, my wife works in the Capitol Office for State Senator Dan Patrick and has for six years, does not do political work. But, um, yeah, look, you know, when Dan came into the United States, excuse me, to the Texas Senate, um, you know, he was a little bit of a bomb thrower, and I think he wanted to change the way the Senate operated, and he quickly learned that uh, it's very hard to change the Texas Senate, uh, particularly if you're just one member. Um, and so he started to, to learn how to work kind of within the system. And he, he worked well enough to get to a point that Dewhurst was willing to uh, appoint him education uh, committee chair, uh, which he served, at, served as in the last session. Um, now, the, the, the key question here, Chad, is going to be, do they get rid of the two-thirds rule? Um, you know, in the United States Senate, you have a you have a 60 vote threshold basically to to, to move any legislation, 60 out of 100. Um, in the Texas Senate, you have essentially an unwritten rule that requires two thirds of the Senate to agree that, that that a bill can move forward. Okay, so uh, you got 31 members, uh, and we are now with Connie Burton's seat, one vote short of two thirds. So I think what's going to happen is they are going to change the rule. I don't know whether it'll be an outright majority or if they'll change it to a 60 percent 
threshold just like they have in the United States Senate. But if they do that, you, instead of the Senate being sort of the slower legislative body, I think you're going to see the Senate be the body that moves things first and forces the House to consider Senate bills and, and, and you know, respond to them. Uh, but you are going to have, uh, you know, you're going to have some, some fights over the budget. You're probably going to have fights over uh, border security with, the you know, the, the amount of funding that goes towards border security. Uh, the legislature has to do something about water, uh, something about transportation. Uh, there's a lot of issues out there. And, of course, Abbott, you know, wants to have a, a you know, a, a strong first session. So everyone's going to be looking to him to see what his state of the state address is, what, what uh, items he declares are emergency items so they can be acted on the first 60 days. So, you know, look, is there some ideological distance between um, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Speaker of the House Joe Strauss? Yes, no question there is. Um, the question is, can the two of them and, and Abbott all get on the same page so that we get the, you know, we get outcomes well, uh, and we don't have a special session? And, and I was about to ask, I mean, you brought up if, you know, if the Senate is moving faster than the House, which is a, a, a huge possibility, what kind of pressure does this put on Joe Strauss? I mean, for years now, uh, it's been the House that has been seen as the more conservative body. That might be flipping right now. Yeah, I think it is going to flip. And, you know, keep in mind um, – that you know, there's a couple things that are that are interesting here. Strauss wins re-election as speaker um, through through his lieutenants, who are the committee chairs and sort of the most senior members that are part of his leadership team, and a mix of Demo- of conservative and moderate Democrats um, that, that support him. That's his coalition. Um, and so you know, as he considers you know what legislation to move forward, um, he's always you know thinking about his coalition as much as he's thinking about what, what the majority of, of House Republicans want, okay? So he has to balance those two things off. That's not something Dan Patrick has to do. So they have different constituencies and different, just different math. Now, if, if, if the House Republicans can somehow get to 100 seats and get, can get maybe two Democrats to switch parties, uh, that does change things. Uh, it does allow, basically, basically removes Democrats from, uh, from any position of any influence in the, in the, in the Texas House. So, look, I, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, you know, you know, what are Strauss's priorities? What are Dan Patrick's priorities? And what are Abbott's priorities? And where do they overlap? I mean, I think you know, Patrick's priorities are border security and property tax reform. Um, you know, the things that Abbott ran on, keeping the economy strong, border security. He wants to pass a sweeping ethics bill. He wants to uh, do something on education. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see where Strauss ends up on, on, on a lot of those things. But yes, I think the Senate's going to move more quickly than the House on a lot of things. Uh, the question again is, where do they overlap? And, and I'm telling you, though, the biggest fight's going to be over the budget. And you're already seeing this come together. Texas Public Policy Foundation uh, has, has sort of laid a marker out there on what a conservative budget would look like. Um, and there are a lot of priorities. And yes, the rainy day fund is flush, but uh, we can't we can't do everything everybody wants to do. Um, so you know, making key investments with uh, with the rainy day fund is, is going to be uh, is going to be uh, an interesting thing to watch. Visiting with Matt McCoviak. Matt, before I let you go, uh, Republicans and, and you know uh, writers out there have been taking a look at the uh, the dynamic of what's going to happen in the U.S. Senate, mainly between Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Do you think you're going to see a lot of Republican battles, or is Ted Cruz going to be mainly focusing? on his own ambitions going into 2016 and sort of leaving Mitch McConnell uh, to his own devices? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think, look, what Cruz wants to uh, achieve in the, in the Republican-majority U.S. Senate and what McConnell wants to achieve are different things. I think McConnell's looking at it from a little bit more realistic standpoint. He realizes that unless you can override the president's veto, um, everything you're doing is essentially messaging. So, you know, I think Cruz is looking at it and saying, we need to repeal Obamacare and we need to stop the executive order on amnesty. Um, and so, you know, what tactics they use to try to prevent those two things remains to be seen. But you're right. I mean, I think we got about six months of the U.S. Senate operating without sort of presidential politics. But by June, uh, you know, Cruz, Paul, perhaps, uh, perhaps Marco Rubio, perhaps Rob Portman, We'll all be in the early states. We'll all be announcing the campaigns, and there'll be missing Senate votes, except on on really critical matters. So, uh, if there's going to be some big fights, but I think McConnell and Boehner both want to stay away from the real extreme stuff and, and and really just try to pass lots of legislation, put it on the president's desk. He'll sign some of it. He'll veto some of it. But he want they want to be able to show what the Republican Party stands for, 
to develop that very clear contrast for 2016. Matt McCoviak, of course, a GOP political strategist, co-founder of MustreadTexas.com. Tell folks what they can find on MustreadTexas.com today. Yeah, a lot of postmortems on the Wendy Davis campaign. I got a couple up there, posting a couple more stories this morning. Uh, all the top news, opinion, blog items, uh, columns are all in one place, MustreadTexas.com. All right, as always, Matt, thank you very much. Thanks, Chad. Have a great week. You too. That's Matt McCoviak. You can follow him on Twitter at Matt McCoviak.